tale of the three little pigs and the big bad wolf is well known across the UK. However, it may have its origins in a tale about two of our native creatures, one widespread today still, and the other confined to folklore. Subscribe to Ferro Forest to keep learning about UK nature. The most famous version of The Three Little Pigs was published in a book of English fairy tales in 1890. In this story, a mother pig sends her three children away to create their own fortunes. The first little pig builds a house of straw, and when a wolf tries to enter, he is denied access. The wolf blows the house down and eats the little pig. The second little pig makes its house out of fur sticks, and again, when the wolf tries to enter, he is denied access. The wolf blows this house down and eats the second little pig. The third little pig makes its house out of brick, and when the wolf comes, it fails to blow the house down. The wolf bargains with the pig, telling it that he will go to a nearby turnip field in the morning and bring the pig some turnips. Then the pig and the wolf will eat the turnips together. The pig agrees, but early the next morning it goes and collects the turnips before the wolf is able to. When the wolf returns to the pig's house, it is angry and tries a new bargain. The wolf mentions a nice apple tree and says that if the pig doesn't deceive it again, then it will bring back some apples for the pig. The pig agrees, but again goes early to the apple tree and picks the apples. But the apple tree was far away, and by the time the pig was heading home, the wolf was already on the path. In fear, the pig climbed a tree. It threw an apple far away for the wolf to run after, and quickly it got home. The next time the wolf tries to tempt the pig to leave the house, he mentions a local fair and asks the pig if it will go. The pig says it will, but again it leaves the house before the wolf. While at the fair, it buys a butter churn, but as it is carrying the churn home, it sees the wolf on the path. With nowhere else to hide, the pig jumps inside the churn. However, it topples over and begins to roll down a hill with the pig inside. The rolling churn frightens the wolf away, and the pig is able to get home safely. The final time the wolf visits, he talks about how scared he was of the mysterious object hurtling towards him. When the pig tells him what happened, he again gets angry, and this time declares that he will climb down the chimney and get the pig that way. The pig quickly puts a pot full of water over the fire. As the wolf jumps down, he takes off the lid so that the wolf falls into the water. The pig then puts the lid back on the pot, boils the wolf, eats him, and lives happily ever afterwards. This rather grim version of the tale has been adapted multiple times since it was first published. In most of these adaptations, the piglets tend to seek shelter with their siblings rather than getting eaten by the wolf. And these adaptations also tend to leave out the parts where the wolf tries to lure the last pig outside of its house. However, it's a version published 40 years prior to this really popular version that I want to focus in on. Dartmoor, in the county of Devon, has a version that features the commonly seen red fox in place of the wolf. However, in place of the pigs, it has a mythological creature that before modern fiction was known about only in Britain, the pixie. Pixies are a mythological creature with stories focused around Devon and Cornwall. There were, and still are to some extent, plenty of people who believed in these creatures that they actually truly existed. They were said to inhabit ancestral sites in like stone circles and ring forts, and they danced and socialised in a way that paralleled medieval celebrations. Tales of pixies date back even before Christianity showed up in Britain, and they're often associated with nature. One tale from Cornwall mentions a pixie that loses his laugh, but it's restored by King Arthur in the form of a chuff. Chuffs are black birds with red bills and legs. They're now restricted to a narrow section in the west of Britain and have an estimated less than 400 breeding pairs remaining. Stories from Devon mention pixies riding on colts in Dartmoor, making tangles in their manes. Although not mentioned in these tales, birds like magpies are known to ride on horses to take bugs from their coats. Is it possible that the myth of pixies originated from a once numerous bird that's now rare in Britain? Of course, that's just me speculating. However, by the early 1800s, there were much less reports of people seeing pixies coming in. In a book written in 1824, it said that the age of the pixies is gone. There is at present perhaps hardly a house that they are reputed to visit. Even the fields and lanes which they formerly frequented seem to be nearly forsaken. Their music is rarely heard. Whether pixies originate from British bird species or not, this is a way that one would seem to talk about bird species that were in decline. It's true that at the same time in the early 1800s, many British bird species were actually undergoing serious and widespread declines. 
Species that were declining included the red kites, Dartford warblers, redback shrikes, goldfinches and corn buntings. So we have pixies in place of pigs and a fox in place of the wolf. Let me tell you how this version of the story goes and then we'll look at the possible reasons for this creature swap. There was once a fox who prowling by night in search of prey came unexpectedly on a colony of pixies. Each pixie had a separate house. The first he came to was a wooden house. Let me in, let me in, said the fox. I won't, was the pixie's answer, and the door is fastened. Upon this, the fox climbed to the top of the house and having poured it down, made a meal of the unfortunate pixie. The next was a stolen house. Let me in, said the fox. The door is fastened, answered the pixie. Again, the house was pulled down and its inmate eaten. The third was an iron house. The fox again craved admittance and was again refused. But I bring you good news, said the fox. No, no, replied the pixie. I know what you want. You shall not come in here tonight. That house the fox in vain attempted to destroy. It was too strong for him and he went away in despair. But he returned the next night and exerted all his fox-like qualities in the hopes of deceiving the pixie. For some time he tried in vain, until at last he mentioned a tempting field of turnips in the neighbourhood to which he offered to conduct his intended victim. They agreed to meet the next morning at four o'clock. But the pixie outwitted the fox, for he found his way to the field and returned laden with his turnips long before the fox was astir. The fox was greatly vexed and was long unable to devise another scheme until he bethought himself of a great fair about to be held a short way off and proposed to the pixie that they should set off for it at three in the morning. The pixie agreed, but the fox was again outwitted for he was only up in time to meet the pixie returning home with his fairings, a clock, a crock and a frying pan. The pixie, who saw the fox coming, got into the crock and rolled himself down the hill, and the fox, unable to find him, abandoned the scent and went his way. The fox returned the next morning, and finding the door open, went in, when he caught the pixie in bed, put him into a box and locked him in. Let me out, said the pixie, and I will tell you a wonderful secret. The fox was after a time persuaded to lift the cover, and the pixie, coming out, threw such a charm upon him that he was compelled to enter the box in his turn, and there at last he died. Although it contains different creatures, this version bears remarking similarity to the Three Little Pigs story. The explanation for the presence of the fox might be a relatively simple one. For hundreds of years, foxes were used as cunning tricksters in different folk tales. This was known as a phenomenon called Reynard the Fox, where foxes were used in medieval arts and stories for a long time. I went into much more detail about this phenomenon in my Goldilocks and the Three Bears video, which I've linked down in the description for you to check out. The mix-up between pigs and pixies in the story may be more of a misunderstanding. In the medieval times, another word for piglets was pigsies. Pixies and pigsies sound very similar, and so someone may have simply misheard how the tale was told and started telling the story about the other creature. But which tale was the original? The fox and the pixies or the wolf and the pigs? Well, there is a transitional tale in existence as well. In 1860, between the two versions I've mentioned, there was another version of the story published which featured a fox and three pigs. So it would appear as though the fox is the older version of the story and the wolf didn't appear until later publications. But what about the pixies? In 1873, there was an article published that writes, there is a very curious connection between the pixies and the wild animals on the moor, especially with the fox, which features in many local stories. These turn frequently on a struggle in craft and cunning between the fox and the pixie. So the fox and the pixies isn't the only story that was written as a tale between these two foes. The Fox and the Pixies is the earliest publication of this story, but it only ever spread locally through the south of England. The Fox and the Pigs appears to have led to the much more famous and widespread Wolf and the Pigs. However, was it the Pigs that inspired the Pixies, or was it the Pixies that inspired the Pigs? Based on what I've said in this video, let me know what you think in the comments below.